Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I have a really special guest for you today. I have, I have the CEO of Obsidian Capital with us. Uh, over $300 million in multifamily uh, investments, uh, 6,500 units. So we gotta talk to this guy. And more, most importantly for me, is his story starts quite simply, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, how you doing today, Glenn? I'm doing great, Mike. Thanks for having me. Pretty excited to be on your show. Yeah, so. your, your story is pretty inspirational. Obviously, you were a referral from David Topin. Uh, and I'm like, oh, I got to get this guy on right before Christmas because the story is just the American dream. Uh, so yeah. Congratulations. Uh, but why don't we introduce and, and people? Oddly, to, go ahead. I was going to say, oddly enough, it feels like a dream sometimes uh, in reference to what you were just saying. So, <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the best ones do. So why don't you just uh, tell us a little bit about Obsidian Capital and, and uh, we'll go from there. Great. Yeah. You know, Obsidian Capital, uh, David Tupin, which you mentioned earlier, he and our business partners, uh, we, we have another business partner that's going to be joining us a little bit later uh, in 2020. Uh, but what we do basically is we just go and syndicate deals. We find the right uh, um, apartment deals and we raise money from investors, our friends, our families. Uh, I've used in the past uh, family offices and some crowdfunding platforms. And we have put together a few deals. Obsidian purchased a nice one uh, up in Fort Worth called Cobble Hill. And it didn't take us very long to fund that deal. Uh, we're going to do a ground up deal here uh, in not too uh, far down the road uh, here in Austin. Mm -hmm. And then um, basically we're looking for opportunities all over the United States. So we love multifamily. So. Very, very cool. So I'm curious, you get to these big impressive numbers. Uh, you know, when did you start? You know, like when was the first syndication? You know, if you remember roughly how many, uh, just try to color, color in the box, right? 6,500 sure. units sounds cool, but how many puzzle pieces did it take to get there? Oh my gosh, it took a lot of little pieces, you know, and some people get kind of overwhelmed when they're like, they, I, I often get asked, well, where do I start? Right. <laughs> You know, how do I do my first one? And, and I'll be honest with you, my first one happened up in Washington and it was a 44 unit apartment deal. And I was acting as a regional manager for a big uh, REIT. And I was volunteering some of my time to sit on the board of directors for the local apartment association up there. Actually, it's called WUMFA, the Washington Multifamily Housing Association. Wow. And uh, when you're on the board of directors, you're there with all the other volunteers. And I had put together a little, the best of my ability, a budget and an opportunity in Tacoma, Washington. And I put it in front of my friend, John. And I said, John, you're a very, very successful, you know, uh, apartment owner. And I want to get into that business, right? I'm, I'm now saying the same thing to a mentor that people say to me, right? I want to get <laughs> And, and he looked at my numbers and he said, it's not a bad deal. You'll probably do okay. He said, but I have a better deal for you. Oh. I'm like, you do? Tell me about it. And he said, I have this little 44 unit deal and I'll sell it to you on contract. So I'll carry a note back, but you got to come up with $150,000. Wow. And I'm like, 155, 100, dude, let me go look at it. So I went and looked at it. Sure enough, this guy was so successful with all these new big apartment complexes that he had completely neglected this little 44 unit deal. Uh, right? It was too yeah. big. And so uh, here's a deal that was fully neglected. So I went back to him, I'm like, yeah, I'm in. He's like, okay, you raise 150 grand and, and I'll sell it to you. So of course I did not have $150,000. I mean, I had five kids. I'm a regional manager in Seattle, Washington. Dude, I live paycheck to paycheck. And, but I knew a good deal when I saw one. And here I am, you know, trying to figure this out. So I went to two people that I knew pretty well. One was my boss and the other was a vendor that we used in the industry that did a bunch of power washing. So I said, Hey, you guys, I found this deal. We need $150,000. We could buy it. I got the financing lined up and he'll carry a note for all of it. And we can go in a third, a third, a third. And they're like, great. How much do you need? And I said, you each put up $75,000. And they scratched their head like, wait, wait, if we're going a third, a third, a third, shouldn't we split the 153 ways? Uh -huh. you know, $75,000 means we're putting up all the money. Yeah. Hey, Glenn, how come you're not putting any money? And I'm like, I found the deal. Mm -hmm. You know, I put it together, lined up the financing. And so they said, and I said, besides that, you guys get paid before I do. 
So, you know, your, your investment's safe. You know, we did that deal. They put up the $150,000. I went to John, here's the down payment. And John said to me, Glenn, it's not a down payment. I want you to take that money that you raised and put it in the deal. Ah. Because there are down units. And he knew that if I fixed up the property, the note he was carrying would be even more secure, yeah. right? So uh, we fixed up the property. We managed it for about a year, year and a half, and sold that sucker for a million dollars more than we paid for it. <laughs> that was my first deal, Mike. I oh, mean, my there you so have what, it. What year was that? Just uh, what year was that? Uh, that had to be 2005, I think. Oh, wow. So pre-crash. Yeah, yeah. Before the big crash. You know, in my book uh, that's coming out, I go into more detail about how that happened and but also how when we sold it, we kind of carried a note back to another buyer that bought it from us and it didn't end as well, right? right. So we lost some of our profits, but you probably have to read that in the book. <laughs> there you go. That makes sense. Well, there's yeah. a couple of things that he, that, you know, I was thinking about this deal as you were going through the story. So first off, again, my words, not yours. Uh, it was a 44 unit building that needed some love, right? It was, yeah. it was, it was yeah, it needed some love. Uh, but it sounded like at least in the beginning, you were ready to jump in, put the 150 K down. Uh, I mean, you were ready to put it down. The owner said, no, no, no invest in the building. I was just thinking, how are you going to fix up the rundown building? But, uh, you know, that previous owner really saved you, I think. Would you agree? I would agree. He was very wise. And when you put together your first deal, you forget about a lot of the little details. When you mentioned the pieces of the puzzle is one yeah. of the first things. I mean, finding a deal is only one piece, but boy, how you finance it and how you raise the capital to fix all the problems. And I found in my you know years, there's generally really not enough money to fix all the problems because in your due diligence, you find and identify, you know, a hundred items that you could fix. So yep. you raise money and you fix them, but there's generally like 105, 110 of them. <laughs> then you scratch your head like, how am I going to, how am I going to yeah. pay for that? But we need to fix it. So yeah, that's, I, I love just talking about the truth. You know, this is 15 years ago, right? So you got the yeah. first deal done. Um, <clears throat> you had, a, you had a situation that protected you. But there are a lot of deals coming across, you know, my plate today, syndications from first time syndicators who are making that fatal mistake. Yeah. They're just raising the capital for the down. Yeah. They're not raising the reserves and all of that. And I'm afraid many of these are going to blow up. Uh, yeah. Um, well, here's a little nugget you could share with your listeners and, and folks, but you know, we're late in the cycle, yeah. you know, and where in the cycle are we? We don't know. I mean, there's lots of data that still supports, good deals and, and growth, but we're late in the cycle. History uh, often repeats itself, right? So we know we're late in the cycle. So when I put together a deal now, um, there's a few items that we really focus on. One, it's no longer going to be a three-year hold. It can ah. be a five to 10-year hold, yep. which means that the financing, I need a 10-year note. So I can't uh, I can't really negotiate a shorter term mm -hmm. because if it goes full term, you know, and then the other, the third thing is I raise enough money for a, ra a rainy day fund. Yeah. It's a tough pill to swallow for both the syndicator and the investor because one, you're going to put the money in a checking account. You're not going to use it, mm -hmm. but yet you're paying some sort of return or preferred return to those investors oh, yeah. on that money. And all it's doing is sitting there as a rainy day fund. But, uh, which means you have to raise a little extra yeah, and you put it in a checking account and the investors are wondering what we're going to do with that money, right? They're like, well, what's this for? Yeah. Or it's the unknown, right? If, if the market starts to flatten or even go down, you know, and you've got to cover some gap, the last thing you want to do is go do a cash call to the investors and say, look, we're out, we're short and yeah. rents have gone down and, and it's going to be stressful. Those days are coming. Oh yeah. So for your listeners and, all that, just structure it that way and, and explain it, know it and be wise. Um, and you'll be, okay. you'll, you'll be better off. Yeah. I'm on record, uh, quite publicly, frankly, cause I'm trying to stop people from losing money. I actually uh, had somebody on a couple weeks ago who got taken by a syndicator, right? It, the deal started good and then went bad and the syndicator ended up, it's ended up going to jail very likely. So, um, Ooh. you got, you have to, if you're looking at deals, look for the rainy day fund, look for the worst case scenario. Because again, we're late in the cycle. We're top of the market. You know, 
whatever you want to call it. It's, it's not as easy as five years ago. Um, yeah. And there are deals out there, you know, oh, yeah. uh, David and I just put a deal under contract. Uh, it's, you know, over 160 units in, in Dallas area. And that deal is still giving fantastic returns. So, uh, and we got that through a, a pretty good relationship. So we're very excited about that opportunity. And then we've got one uh, that we came to terms on. It's under LOI in Michigan. Nice. You know, which David knows that market pretty well. So there are deals out there, right? Yeah. So you just got to be really cautious. And we're really cautious right now. Yeah, you've got to be really cautious. There, yeah, I want to get back to this. There are deals out there, right? There, there are absolutely deals out there. They're typically relationship-based. As you mentioned, Glenn, that's how you're going to find them today. They're not on LoopNet. That's where deals go to die. Um, you know, so there's, I, social media is just making this look too easy, right? It's, there's not that many unicorns standing with four-leaf clovers in their mouth. Um, yeah, which yeah. is what the market is today, but they're out there. It does happen. Um, yeah. but, but let's get back to your story. So it starts with 44 yeah. units. You, you make a million bucks, you lose a little bit on the resale or the default or whatever it was, but you know, 44 to 6,500, um, you know, take us through that timeline, right? There's 15 years. You yeah. Know, kind of give us the big chunks. Let, if you me, will. Yeah. We'll, we'll back up to the very beginning, which yeah. is where, you know, where it all kind of started. I was going to college at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, and um, uh, I had the opportunity to work part time as a maintenance man. Ah, you know, like uh, at the apartment place where we were working, they knew that uh, I was going to college, that I had some time, and they didn't want to hire a full time. But it was a big property; it was 350 units, and they were all constantly behind. So I I got on uh, as a part time maintenance guy. You know, I did all this all the crazy things, right? I mean, I wouldn't say crazy, they were hard, right? Mm -hmm. In Salt Lake City, I had to put ice melt down and you know, salt on the sidewalks in the winter time, and that's brutal. Maintenance guys that do that, hats off, I hated that. And then um, painting apartments and fixing toilets and stoves and just little <laughs> things that I, I had very minimal skills, but I could do some basics, and they used me for that. Well, the manager and the, ma and the leasing agent, they're in the office, it's warm and toasty, <laughs> They're talking on the phone, you know, they're having relationships with uh, prospective tenants that, you know, they build a little bond and then they lease and then they got a leasing commission. And I'm just like, holy cow, I want that job. So uh, I talked to my boss and my boss's boss and said, hey, if you guys ever have a manager job uh, come available, you know, think about me. And they're like, wait, aren't you a part-time maintenance guy? Yeah. I'm like, I am. But uh, they, they had a little 60 unit building come up. And they couldn't afford a full-time manager or a full-time maintenance guy. Ah. And the property wasn't doing well. So they said, we're going to hire you for both. I said, perfect. Sign me up. So I became a part-time manager and a part-time maintenance guy. And oh my goodness, the lessons that I learned, so valuable. I, was, I would do the make ready. Then I would lease that apartment. They would sign a lease. And then they would bring in their move-in checklist about how everything worked in the apartment when they moved in. It wasn't even a part of the townhouse. They were all town townhomes. Uh, and I would read that list and I'm like, oh my gosh, your stove doesn't work. I'm like, they're like, yeah, one of the burners isn't working or or the dishwasher won't come on. Right. I'm like, ah. and the, and they complain, they're like, they complain to the manager. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't know who did the maintenance on this, but he's not very good. And I'm like, I'll send over somebody huh. and we'll get it taken care of. Well, I go change my clothes, I put on my maintenance clothes, and I run over there and they're like, What are you doing here? And I'm like, Well, I'm also the maintenance guy. <laughs> awkward silence there right they're like so you're the guy that i'm like yeah i'm like okay i'm sorry and they're like that's ah, okay so i learned how valuable it is to be a good maintenance guy because yeah. it makes the manager's job a lot easier and then i learned uh, how important it is to be uh ha for if you're going to be a good successful property manager you better have a dang good maintenance guy yeah because they go hand in hand you know and one can't be successful without the other for sure. Yeah. That's where I started. Right. So I started that and then I uh, got into management and then I went on to be a regional manager and then I grew to director of operations. And then I was the president of a property management company. Oh, wow. Uh, so that, that's kind of my career. And I worked for some properties that were REITs, big national equity residential. I did uh, some construction buildup for tax credit. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, so I did a lot of the section 42 uh, tax credit, the low income housing tax credit stuff. And then I did a fee management, just straight on fee management 
uh, property management for owners. Wow. So I, I covered all of the bases and, and I guess at the end of the day, really, you know who are making all the money were the owners. Yeah. I might've been a good property manager, but when it came time to sell that property or create the value add or whatever, and they were hiring me to do all that work, I got a, I got a pat on the back and they said, dude, you're really good at this. Thank you. But they're the ones that went to the bank, right? They cashed that check and it was big. And I'm like, dude, someday I want to be that guy. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, that's a great, you know, seeing that, you know, putting in the effort, you know, working up the corporate ladder or, 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 you know, up in jobs and then really putting two and two together to see who made the money, right? You yeah. had an income, right? They, uh, they, they had wealth. Yes. Uh, I had a W two paycheck exactly. and those dudes were taking risks and putting, and they were depending on me as a property manager to take care of their property. Um, but yeah, they, was, they were getting big checks. Very, very cool. So tie this together for me, right? So you're, you're working up the corporate ladder, going all the way up uh, to the president and you somewhere along that way, it seems like you did the 44 unit deal. When does, yep. when do you get to the point where you go, you know what, I'm going to dump the W two and I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go all in on yourself. Okay. So that's a great question. So that occurred, I was in Austin, Texas, uh, as the president of a property management company, uh, still W two basically, uh, working. Uh, I mean, I was a, I was a small partner in the property management company, but it was really small and I had very little ownership of it. But, um, somebody had passed on a, on an opportunity and there was a 200 unit deal where the bank said, Hey, we're getting ready to foreclose on this deal. Uh, we're going to, you know, we want to hire you to tell us what it's going to take to fix it. And I basically did my analysis for them. Uh, mm -hmm. I did a, an operating budget and stuff. And I said, based on where they are, you know, they had 50 units that were boarded up. And basically I told them you need a million dollars bank, uh, in rehabs to get this back online if you want to save your note. Right. They said, we're foreclosing, but we are not investors. We're the bank. We don't want to put in a million bucks. And so I said, dude, I will. And they're like, do you have a million bucks? I said, nope. Uh, <laughs> nope. In story that was on that 44 unit, it's now on this one, but I need a million dollars, not 150,000, right? Wow. Same story. And this just happened to be about, oh gosh, six, seven years ago. Um, and but by me buying that deal uh, with a new business partner uh, as the president of a property management company, it, it was time to leave that, that, that and go be a full-time you yeah. know, um, investor. Because what I made on selling that apartment complex was what I would make for five years as a oh. W-2, one deal, there right? You when you get a check like that and you're like, dude, I would, it would take me five years of working full time for somebody else to make this amount of money. Yeah. I'm like, I'm done. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then, Life leaves hints. It leaves clues. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And big paycheck. And then, but you know, in my book, it talks about how I did that though, because I had to basically write a loan commitment fee to that bank that was foreclosing as I bought it. And it, and it took my checking account basically. Well, I'll just tell you somewhere in the neighborhood of, I had to write a check for $57,000 and I think I had 60 or $70,000 in my checking account, yeah. which I had been saving for a long time. Right. Right. So now I'm like about to be down to zero and broke uh, on a gamble right. that I can raise that million dollars. Cause the bank's like, we'll carry a note, but we need a commitment from you. Right. <sighs> talk about sweat and bullets, you know, and so that's also in my book. It, I talked about how to, you know, what I was going through to, to do that. Um, but yeah. So Talk you, about nerve wracking. Yeah. I just want to make sure I caught that right. So a uh, bank reaches out to you to evaluate a deal. You evaluate a deal uh, probably for a commission or a flat fee or whatever it is for noise. You say you need a million bucks or they need a million bucks. They're like, nope, not for us. We're going to foreclose. You, you say, I'll take it. They say, do you have a million bucks? You say, no, but I can get it. And before they say yes to you, you have to cut a personal check for 57 grand, which probably buys you I don't know, 30 or 60 days to raise the money. Is that kind of where we are in the That's story? Correct. They called it a loan commitment fee because they were going to carry the note back at foreclosure. And they're like, we need to make sure that you're going to pay us a loan commitment fee to stay in. Right. And it was a percentage, you know, yep. of, of amount they were going to carry back. And so they, I did that and, wow. um, and then started raising money just 
from friends and family. And, you know, for nine, I'd meet with 10 people, nine would tell me no. Yeah. You know, and, and when you're starting out, one of the questions an investor may ask is how many of these have you done? Right. Well, this is my first big one, you know? Yeah. And they're like, I'm out. Yeah. Done. The question, do you know somebody else who might be willing to invest it? So for every no I got, I generally got two or three maybes call somebody else. Right. And I would, you know, and my business partner and I, we were just working the phones and, and, and we eventually did it. Nice. Right. Because it was a good deal. That's why. Oh, of if course. If the deal's a good deal, you can find investors. Oh, absolutely. So let's, let's get people to really understand what it took. So how did you, did you have 60 days or 90 days? How much time did you have? Do you remember? We, have, we had 90 days. Okay. So mm -hmm. you had 90 days. Oh, that, no problem. That's only what? 10, is that 10 grand a day? Roughly? I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. I was trying to do the math in my head. It didn't work. Uh, uh, so you had 90 days to raise a million bucks. Um, do you remember how many people ended up contributing? Was it like 20 people or 10, 12? Do you remember how many? Uh, people actually, no. We only had about eight, okay. seven or eight. All right. So yeah. you, had, you had eight commitments. We had a couple people that put up some big amounts and then some that put up very little amounts. Fair enough. So, so, and it took you, I mean, when did you get the final yes to, to put a bow on it? Was it like day 87 or... Oh, no, we okay. actually closed on it before we had all the full million okay. because they had scheduled a foreclosure. It went to the foreclosure. The bank was in a tough spot. We were in a tough spot. They asked, do you have the full million? Like, no, but we had 750 of it already committed. Like, all right, well, you've got to, you know, put it in our escrow and you've got to do the rehab. And, you know, before the end of the rehab, you got to make sure you have the rest of the money. Like, we will. So they were working with us. Nice. And we were working with them. So those days are pretty much gone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no opportunities like that anymore. But, but it, was, it was a big deal. That's what launched us buying multifamily deals and becoming an owner, right? Oh, for sure, yeah. It, it, shortly it, it, after that, it, that we started getting calls from other people where I left property management. And they're like, oh, we heard you're out on your own. Would you like to buy my property? And I'm like, yes, I would. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes yeah. please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I have a whole chapter in my book about just relationships, right? Oh, build those relationships up and then how do you, you know, how do you use them to capitalize uh, opportunities? Yeah. Relationships are, again, we said it earlier, right? Relationships are how deals are done at the top of the market. Uh, they're yeah. not, they're not, they're not out there being marketed. Um, yeah. Right. They're being, they're, it's through relationships. It, relationships always work. Uh, which is key. So again, just so people understand, right, this was seven years ago. So that was 2012, probably, you know, at or near the bottom of the crash. Uh, this was in yep. Texas, I think you said, right? So yep, that's right. Not, not quite as not quite like California crash, but still a down market. Uh, hence yeah. why banks were flexible. Um, yeah, obviously. And I'll tell you, here's what put us on the map, Mike. Um, about a year or two later, I had um, reached out to one of my friends, his name is Ed. And he and I had been friends for about 10 years. And 10 years ago, I told him, dude, if you ever want to retire, call me. I'll buy your company from you. And he laughed because he was 70 years old at the time. And he's wow. like, I'm never going to retire. I love this business. And he was pretty good at it, very successful. But something happened in, um, around his 80th birthday. Uh, something occurred, and I think health-wise or something. But he called me on the phone out of the blue. He was like, you still want to buy my company? I'm like, Yeah. You know, I'm out on my own now. And he's like, well, I want to sell my management company. I'm like, dude, I don't need to buy a management company. I could start one of those in my sleep. And I said, what I want are those eight apartment complexes that you have up in Dallas. And he's like, well, if you buy those eight, then I really won't have any people to help me with my stuff that I have remainder up in Seattle and Bellevue. And I'm like, well, why don't we just leave the management company in place? You sell me the eight and I'll buy your management company. Ah. And he's like, okay, let's do that. <laughs> so on a handshake, on a handshake, uh, we, we struck a deal. And here's the benefit of that. You know, I was all, at this time I was also a real estate broker. So I was able to earn a commission mm -hmm. uh, because there were no brokers involved, right? Which kind of helped. Uh, crowdfunding was a big deal at that time. Mm -hmm. And it was just getting on the market. So we put not eight deals in front of crowdfunding companies. Wow. And they love these deals that he was selling us. So from crowdfunding, we probably funded seven of the eight. Wow. Right. And, and just closed. I mean, we had to, I mean, here we were young in our industry, youngest indicators, but closing 
gosh, that was almost a hundred million dollar transaction between those deals. And we had to go raise $22 million. And <laughs> those kind of numbers are staggering, right? Yeah. But I stumbled into it because I, at that point I had only purchased maybe three or four apartment complexes. Yeah. So I was still relatively new, but I found a great attorney that did the LLCs and the, uh, they did all of the, um, purchase and sell agreements and title review and offerings. I mean, they were really good and they're just in San Antonio, Texas, but they were really, really good. And they helped me get through a lot of stuff that I didn't know anything that I was doing. Then got really tight with a title company who was calling me on the phone. Like, look, you need to do this, this, and this. They were walking me th through things that I had really never done before as a property manager, or even when I bought the little deals. I, I mean, this was big time at this point. So yeah. <sighs> relationships. I was going to say so far, what we've taken from this, uh, this great interview is relationships matter. Uh, you know, good deals. Oh, you can always raise the money with good deals. Um, you know, continue to take positive steps forward, pick up the phone, ask for references, lots of, lots of great stuff. Uh, so you mentioned a couple of times, Glenn, this book, uh, I think you have oh, a yeah. sample for us. Why don't, why don't you show the book and, and give us a tease of other things that are in it? Oh, Maintenance Man, the Millionaire. That's a great title. Yeah, Maintenance Man, the Millionaire. Uh, and, and then it just says, uh, you know, real estate wealth creation Perfect. for everyday people. That's right? awesome. Yeah. And uh, I got a little thing on the back about my wife and I, you oh, know, and oh. stuff. So, yeah, it's going to come out uh, on, in, on Amazon probably in the first week in January. So, Pretty excited. I'll, I'll get that date to you when it will be available and maybe you can share with your listeners, but I'm pretty excited about it. I will. But really what happened was a couple of people that had heard my story, how I started off as a maintenance guy and, and eventually started buying deals and then built up, you know, a management company and got up to 6,500 units under property management and 4,500 units under ownership. And people are like, dude, how? that's like a dream. You know I mean? Everybody would like to do that, quit their W2 and, yeah. and they're like, you need to write a book. And I'm like, right. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed. But then after I heard that from two or three people, I actually set one of my goals. Um, I wish I had my goal sheet here. I, I set goals each year. And that in 2019, my goal was write a book and share my story. Yeah. And, and in there, there's stuff about relationships and, having good partners and bad partners because that can make or break you yeah. uh, how I had to file bankruptcy and a house in Seattle got foreclosed on. And, you know, I mean, all my ups and downs, all my little life lessons and nuggets are all in there. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't know, I'm pretty excited about it actually. And oh, it's, congratulations. It's, I think it's pretty valuable to some readers if they want to read it because it really is, it'll walk you through the goods and the bads. <laughs> that, that's awesome. Uh, writing a book is a huge accomplishment. You deserve a huge pat on the back. It is not easy. Writing, editing uh, a book is not easy and then and getting it out there. So congratulations, Glenn. That, yeah, thank huge. you, Mike. I appreciate that. You're very welcome. So I got two more things before we wrap this up is what would you say to somebody who sees social media, thinks that raising money or syndication is easy, they've never done a deal. What would you advise them Right. If they're if they're see this in January of 2020, uh, what what would you advise, quote unquote, the new wannabe syndicators? What would be your advice to them? Yeah, my advice would be don't do the first one or two on your own. If you find a great deal and you want to get into that deal, uh, I would call somebody that's got a lot of experience and said, hey, let's be partners on this one. Right. Right. And that that one that'll do a couple of things for you it may help you win deals if you've got a partner that's, you know, really deep. But the other thing is, is just introducing you to the, how it actually flows. Cause it's one thing on paper. It's another thing in real life on how the transaction flows, you know, from LOI to purchase sell agreement to offerings, to title review, to the financing mm -hmm. and, and, and the inspections and due diligence. I mean, there's a lot. And if you're not careful, just one of the mistakes on, on that little process could cost you a lot of money in other areas. Um, and so my suggestion would be call somebody that you know that's done a lot of them, partner with them. Uh, I partnered with a guy on 184 units uh, that he, he found a great deal and even the lender liked the deal. Wow. Um, wanted a Fannie Mae loan and he went to a crowdfunder and they liked the deal, but they're like, you as a sponsor, you're pretty weak. 
you know, I can't commit to you because this is your first deal. Oddly enough, the lender and the, and the crowdfunding both use my name, you know, I, and I didn't ask them to, they just did. So this guy called me, he's like, I've heard your name from a couple of different people. Can we meet? And he was a good guy, you know, and, and I said, I'll partner with you on this one deal. And, uh, we got him through and he was, and to this day, we're, we're really close friends just because of what he learned. Well, now he's out looking at deals all on his own. He doesn't need me anymore. Yeah. Right. So that, that would be one suggestion. Is, is I think that. that's that's the best suggestion you could have given, and, and frankly, what I was hoping you were going to say is focus on folk, new syndicators. This is what I would say: find a mentor, find somebody that's willing to partner with you if you find a great deal, and then spend all your time looking for a great deal. Right? The unicorn holding yeah. a four-leaf clover is out there. Uh, you yeah. just got you got to go find them, and then uh, you know your partner, uh, your experienced partner will help you. So awesome! Now for the second piece of this, let's assume yeah. you're somebody with money. Uh, you are seeing five offers a week from syndicators. Uh, how would you, as a limited partner, right, the money side of this, the equity side, what would you tell someone who's never invested in a syndication before? What are the things they should check for? Uh, because I've been, I'm on public record saying it's risky to get into a new syndication today. What would you tell L LP to think it about? Is. Yeah, I think there's two little nuggets that you could share with, with your listeners. One is go meet with the, with the sponsor and spend time to get to know that sponsor. Ask them questions, ask them about their successes, their failures, uh, their deals, how many they've done, uh, and then do your research on, on the sponsor. Uh, in my book, I talk about you know, relationships and we do business in this industry with people we like to do business with, not who we have to do business exactly. with. Exactly. Yeah. And if you're looking at five deals, all from syndicators, you know, if they, if all the numbers, all things being equal, they all have similar returns and they're in, you know, different markets, get down to who you want to do business with. Ask that person about some of their failures and how they dealt with it, you know, and, and go that route. Um, gosh, I had another thought. Uh, and I forgot what it was. The other <laughs> night. I forgot. I should have wrote it down. Um, oh, it's okay. Yeah. It, it'll come back to you. I'm sure. So, uh, Glenn, this has been so much fun. Why don't we plug your book one more time, show it on screen because people yes. need to get this in January. Yeah. Maintenance Man and Millionaire, uh, Glenn Gonzalez, and, and uh, you know, real estate wealth creation for just everyday people. You know, it talks about, you know, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. If you want to, there's certain, I found there's certain key things in, in any journey that will help you create wealth. And I shared those in the books. So. That's awesome. The book. Well, do me a favor, send me your address because I want to send you my book, One Rental at a One. Time. I love it. Yeah, so we can swap, auto you got to autograph it though. We can swap autograph books and then I'll do a book review on yours uh, in January for you if you don't, okay. uh, if you don't mind. Okay, and I'll be out on the West Coast uh, in January in, in Los Angeles area. So maybe we can hook up. Where are you located? Where are you sitting? I'm in Bay Area, Mountain View, so near San okay. Francisco, yeah. Yeah, but gotcha. I, I go to LA occasionally. It might work out. Okay. Uh, so, so Glenn, thank you for this. It's been a lot of fun. I love uh, I love your story, right? So Thank you so much. Man. And thanks for having me on your show. This is a lot of fun and I appreciate you. Oh, I look forward to doing it again. Thank you very much, buddy. All right. Have a good one. You too. Bye.